Hi, this is Sonia from An Enthusiastic Reader. Thanks for joining me in this video where I plan to talk about some of the books that I've read over the last about two and a half months since the last time I did a catch up video. And I also want to maybe talk about some of the books I may read uh, in the <laughs> I may read, hi, this is Clementine. I may end up reading in the next couple of months as the year kind of winds down. So I wanted to catch you up. And first of all, I just wanted to say I reached over 500 subscribers. It's taken me three years to do that. And I just want to say thank you so much if you've subscribed or if you, if you haven't and you're watching this, just thank you for you know, watching my videos and going through my reading journey with me, if you want to call it that. Uh, I really appreciate all of the comments I get. And I also really appreciate people just popping in and not making a comment if they don't want to. So thank you so much. It's just been, um, you know, getting through these crazy times, um, having this channel as a way to express my creativity or my reading life has been really good for me. So thank you so much. And now I'll just get on to talking about the books. The first book I'm going to talk about is called Wayward by Dana Spiata. And this book was a bit of a disappointment for me. Um, I usually, the, well, I'd say the last novel I read of hers was called Innocence and Other. She's almost exactly my age. And so a lot of her writing sensibility really, especially in that book, kind of clicked with me in terms of my experience growing up in the 80s, uh, female friendships and betrayals and just all of those things. Uh, and, and using technology, especially talking on the telephone, was kind of woven into that storyline. I love that book. I thought it was really good. I've never heard anyone talk about it on BookTube. So that is a great backlist book to read if you're interested in kind of delving back into the past on those you know, that time period and what it was like then, back then in the 80s. But Wayward is set in the contemporary time. Um, and uh, it's it just did not work as well for me. The woman, the main character is going through menopause and menopause to me is a literary device or a literary plot point if that's mostly the basis of what the story is, to me is not all that interesting. Um, and this woman is going through a crisis as she's getting to be that age, she's evaluating her life. It takes place in Syracuse, New York. And so the Syracuse history of uh, feminism and suffrage rights and women and the Oneida uh, is it a cult? The Oneida community that developed around that area where men were very much dominating the actual discourse of that. And they were creating um, silverware and plates and stuff as part of this community to raise money to support the community. Anyway, that all of this is woven into the story and Syracuse plays a big role in the novel itself. But the main character is upper middle class and she decides um, to just leave her husband and her high school daughter and go buy a dilapidated house and make it her own. Um, so she's really obviously questioning her marriage and her place in society and as a woman in society. Um, but I just, you know, I don't have to like a character in order to enjoy the book or to connect with the book. But I really thought that this woman's selfishness and kind of obliviousness to her own privilege, even though she was supposed to be kind of fighting against that by kind of moving to this very poor neighborhood. And, um, and then there is a shooting that she witnesses. And so I didn't really like the way that uh, she the author co-opted this idea of shooting an African-American teenager and then the main character witnessing it. And, you know, I, I just didn't like the way it all came together. So I did read it. Um, some of the writing was really good, uh, but it just wasn't a book for me. Finished the entire Alexandria Quartet. I did it as a buddy read with Teresa and Teresa pops up in comment sections all across booktube and Instagram, bookstagram. She's really fun to read books with. And so this summer we read all of the Alexandria Quartet. And the final novel in this quartet is uh, Clea. 
or Clea. I'm not exactly sure which is the right pronunci pronunciation. I call it Clea. Um, and it's very hard to talk about this quartet without spoiling anything or kind of ex ruining the experience of, of reading each book for yourself and discovering what the author was trying to do with each perspective and how one book seems very straightforward and then you read this, the next in the quartet and then it totally upends what the narrator of the first book was thinking and so on and so on. And it starts beginning before World War II and then World War II does play a big that, you know, factor in at the final novel. So I, I'm so glad I read it. I, I was bewitched by some of it. I was very confused by parts of it. But all in all, I think um, it was a really rich and rewarding reading experience. So if you're ever curious about it, I would say read the first one and then read the second one. And you'll know by the end of the second novel, which is called uh, Balthazar, whether or not you want to read the final two books in the series. I read The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel, and it was a semi-satisfying semi read for me. I waited a long time after its publication to read it because uh, I really loved Station Eleven so much, and I knew that this book was nothing like Station Eleven. Uh, it's the story of a brother and a sister. Uh, the time periods, it's very broken up in time, so it just jumps around on the timeline a lot between what happens as these siblings, who are very far apart in age and not really close, uh, finally encounter this man who is a con man who has set up a pyramid scheme. And the main character in the novel pretends to be his wife. It's kind of a, a relationship of convenience. She's given basically anything she wants as long as she pretends to be his wife in these scenarios of luring rich people into the scheme. And her brother is also kind of a side character. He pops up here and there. Um, the perspectives of the stories bounce around a lot. And I truly liked the experience of reading this novel and I liked the story, but the ending was less than satisfying for me. Still glad I read it. And uh, I really like Emily St. John Mandel's uh, writing style and the way she tells stories and the way she kind of weaves into the psychology of her characters. And uh, I think she's just a great talent, um, although this book didn't completely work for me. Okay, the next novel I'd like to talk about is called Angel by Elizabeth Taylor. She was a British novelist in the mid 19... mid... 20th century. Uh, she wrote this book in 1957, and it is set in the late 1800s and goes all the way to post-World War II. So it's essentially a very big chunk of this particular main character's life. Her name is Angel, and she and her mother are very pretty poor, and Angel has a very vivid imagination. She's not particularly likable in any way, but she decides she wants to be a writer. The very beginning of the novel starts off where her teacher punishes her for using fancy language in a story that she wrote. And at that point, Angel was so humiliated by the experience that she tells her mother, I'm never going to school again. I'm just going to become a famous writer. And her aunt, who works for a very rich uh, woman in the community, tries to dissuade her and tells her she needs to go to school. And Angel is completely stubborn. And she just starts writing and writing. She stays in her bed and she writes and writes. And she does end up getting this kind of preposterous, very fantastical novel. It's a romance, but it's and it's based in history, but it's not based on real history because Angel doesn't know anything about history, but she just uses what she has heard and, and basically what she's heard because she's not a reader. She doesn't want to read anybody else's novels. She just wants to write her own novels. Anyway, she ends up getting published and becoming very famous. She becomes world famous, even though her books are really not good. And so the whole novel is about her relationships with people in her life. It's about her relationship to her mother and her aunt. And then it's her relationship to a fan of hers who really loves her novels and essentially gives up her whole life to come live with Angel. 
and tend to her every need and try and keep her going. And this woman also has a brother who comes into the story and Angel falls in love with him. So it's all of these relationships. And it's all the people in the town. It's her publisher who has to contend with her very stubborn and impetuous rude behavior. She is not nice. She doesn't have good manners, but it's a really interesting story. Some of it, some of it is quite funny. Um, it's just Elizabeth Taylor really created this whole world and brings us into it. And it's not a very long novel, but I really enjoyed, I enjoyed it all the way from the beginning to the end. So I would recommend that. I'm going to keep reading Elizabeth Taylor novels because she was really good. And the other one I had ever read of hers was called At Mrs. Lippincott's. Some people didn't like that, but I, it was her first novel and I thought it was really good. So she's really good at creating very intricate characters with their psychologies and all of their faults. Uh, her characters are definitely flawed. That brings them to life. I read an advanced copy of a memoir that came out last week. It's called Smile, the Story of a Face by the playwright Sarah Rule. And this memoir, I'm very sure she wrote it herself because it's a very deep dive into her own life as an artist, as a playwright. And then what happens, she has a very difficult um, pregnancy with twins and something goes wrong during the delivery and Sarah develops Bell's palsy. And so most of this memoir is about her contending with her disease and wondering if it's going to go away because a lot of times when people develop this paralysis on part of their face, it will get better and sometimes even just goes away. But she isn't able to smile as women are so expected to smile all the time. And particularly uh, people who are working in the arts and she's having to work with actors and directors to put on her plays. And it seems like uh, their relationship and reaction to her is dependent on the way that she looks at them um, and the way that she is no longer able to emote. And so she talks about that a lot. She also talks about what will happen if her children never see her smile. Will they become you know, unhappy? Do they not know that she loves them so much because she can't smile at them? And she also talks about a lot of historical references and writing about smiling. And that's a big part of it. And then it talks about other health issues that she finds out about too. So um, it's a very discreet part of her life, but I thought it was so good. I really enjoyed just like living with her and her brain and her language abilities and contemplating why we are expected to smile in order to relate to people and make them feel at ease and make them know that we are nice and that we care about them or that we are placating them or whatever. So it, it just takes into account a whole lot of cultural expectations, gender expectations, the role of writing plays, the art of writing, and then the problems and joys of motherhood too. So uh, I really enjoyed it and I'm so glad I read it. And the last book I want to talk about that I'm re that I just read was called Oh William by Elizabeth Strout. Now you know that I really love the novels of Elizabeth Strout. She's definitely one of my favorite writers. And this novel is uh, a companion piece to My Name Is Lucy Barton, which was written several years ago. Laura Linney made a play out of it, and. So that story was about trauma. It was about childhood trauma kind of coming out through Lucy Barton's story of her life that she's telling. And it ends up being that that book was Lucy's memoir. So, I mean, it's a fictional memoir, but what we read was what was published in this universe of this fictional world. Anyway, uh, the second novel or the second, yeah, the second collection was called Anything is Possible. And it was about people who were kind of related to Lucy Barton in, in various ways. I didn't feel that Anything is Possible was successful for me. I did not enjoy the process of reading that one as much, although I still love Elizabeth Strout's writing. But O. William brought me right back to what I truly felt was 
just this deep emotional connection to the character of Lucy Barton. She's writing it about her ex-husband, William. And the setup at the beginning is that her second husband has just died. So she's a widow. And her first husband, William, has just been left by his wife. Or she will soon leave. Anyway, it's about Lucy's relationship with William as he's really struggling with his own midlife crisis or ender older life crisis. I guess he's not really exactly midlife anymore, but he's a professor and he also does research, scientific research, and things are kind of falling apart for him in many different ways. And the book is about Lucy's relationship with William and also a, her relationship with her daughters. And she very slowly and carefully reveals details through this telling that reveal her even more. And so I feel like I know this character, Lucy Barton, so well, uh, as well as I know the Olive Kittredge character from the novels that I've read about her, Olive Kittredge, and then Olive again. So I think Strout is so good at this. I mean, and I know it's not for everyone, but um, there's some so much like real pain that comes out of this and then tenderness and then forgiveness and love. And it just, it seemed to me to be a very good book to read this winter when we're all maybe grappling with our own griefs and uh, anxieties and looking at our pasts and trying to figure out where our futures are going and um, what happens when we get older. And there's just so much that's tied up in these books. So uh, I highly recommend a William, if you like anything about Elizabeth Strout's novels. So that's all the books. That, that, those are all the books I'm going to talk about. Right now, I am reading Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, which I'm truly enjoying. And I also have my copy of Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. And I kind of want to just become a hermit and hole up and hide until I get this book read because I know it's going to be good. I know I'm going to like it. And I know a lot of people are not going to like it because it's Jonathan Franzen and all of his weird history that people hate about him. So um, those are the books that I really have on my radar for this month. I'm also going to be reading a book called Montana 1948 by Larry Brown for a book club. And so I'll be reading that for sh those books for sure. I also have a couple of Victorian era novels I'd like to read. I'd like to reread The Scarlet Letter, uh, which was written during the Victorian age. But of course, it's not about Victorian England. It's about, uh, you know, when the pilgrims came in the 1600s and about sin and redemption and all of that and uh, shame. And I, so I want to read that. And I also would like to read Ruth by Elizabeth Gaskell. It's a novel I haven't read. And I think, you know, when I was reading um, Adam Bede, I saw in some of the criticism that Elizabeth Gaskell's novel, Ruth, also kind of has some parallels to the story in Adam Bede. So am I getting that right? I think I am. So, so that's my plans. Those are my plans for October. Um, November, I am going to be reading a memoir of Edna O'Brien with Sean, Sean the Book Maniac, and I will be reading Gilead with Kim from Middle of the Book March. So those are my buddy read plans for November. And then after that, I'm like a free spirit. I don't know exactly what I'll read beyond those books that I've committed to, but I'm always excited when I get to November and December because the book clubs I'm in, we do not read together. So I feel like I have just this open two months to just like go crazy and read whatever I want. So we'll see what I feel like reading at that time. And Anyway, I've come to the end of my video and I thank you so much for spending time with me and listening to me. Please tell me what you think about any of these books in the comments or what you're reading or what your plans might be. And thank you so much for everything and for being here. Bye.